Okay. <coughs> so uh, here are two and two skeletons, two uh, two skeletons of very different animals. One uh, is a whale, and the other one is a hummingbird. So these animals are very different. Uh, they are like two or three orders of magnitude different in, difference in size. Uh, one uh, is a mammal, one is a feathered dinosaur. Uh, and still you see that despite all these differences, they have very similar body plan. Uh, so you can make very nice correspondence between you know, the limbs, uh, the skull, and so on and so forth. And so this tells you that many animals share basically the, the very basic fundamental organization. And today I will tell you about this uh, fundamental organization. And one of the most interesting aspects is most visible on the whale. And I want, to, you know, I want to, you to focus on essentially the spine. And you see that the spine uh, of, the, of the whale uh, is made of metameric units that we call vertebrae. So you see these this little things here, these are vertebrae. And more generally, we call them segments. And today, I will tell you about the way these uh, segments form. Uh, this is called vertebrate segmentation. And another term for vertebrate segmentation is somatogenesis. So before going into the detail of what somatogenesis is and how it works, I'm going to give you a slightly more uh, evolutionary standpoint. So uh, segmentation is a very fundamental feature of many animals. It appeared a long time ago. So these are animals from Cambrian. Uh, this guy is called Opabinia. This guy is called uh, uh, Cinea. And you see that even in these very first animals, their body plan is made of metameric unit segments. So uh, this is an old feature of many, many animals. Still, this is not such a common feature. So here's a phylogenic tree of uh, bilaterians. And if you look at which, which phyla are segmented, you only have basically three phyla. So this is uh, these three phyla which are segmented. So the annelids, uh, so you see uh, different worm, worms. Then you have the arthropods, so the arthropods like insects, uh, you know, crabs, spiders. Uh, these guys are segmented. And so you are here, the vertebrate, but not other vertebrates, I mean, other deuterostomes. Uh, not all of them are, are segmented, but the vertebrates are segmented. So these animals, uh, some of these animals have their body plan based on segments, metameric units. And the um, current consensus on the way these things evolve is that it evolved uh, multiple times. Even though there are molecular mechanisms which seems to be common to all segmented animals, uh, it's, I mean, when you look at this phylogenic tree, it's plausible that this is something that evolved multiple times. So uh, now let's focus a bit on the deuterostomia. And so even uh, at the Cambrian, you are already observing a segmented structure very close to what we see uh, in, uh, I mean, in today's animals and in our branch of the tree of life. So this is uh, an animal called Picaya. So uh, people assume it's, uh, it's a possible Cambrian ancestor of Ascidians. So example of Ascidians are uh, Siona. So this is uh, Siona intestinalis. So this is the adult form of Siona. But what is interesting is that uh, they have a larvae form. So this, is, this looks like, you know, superficially it looks like a sponge or something like that. For me, it looks like a sponge. I'm sure it's, it's for biologists, it's, uh, it would be something else. But when you look at larvae of Siona, they really look like tadpole with, you know, like you have uh, some kind of uh, structure, a bit like otoliths. And then you have uh, an autochord here which looks very similar to the notochord of Picaya. And so in particular in Picaya, you see this myotome. So you, you see these little segments. And you see the same thing in Sayona. And I mean, of course, it's not quite a one-to-one -one correspondence. But if you look at a frog tadpole, you know, you kind of have the same, the same kind of structure. Uh, this guy is not a vertebrate. It has no skeleton. It has only a muscle structure, a muscle-like structure. OK, so uh, we're going to focus uh, in a minute uh, on, the, on the vertebrate segmentation, uh, the frog and ourselves. But before I go to there, I would like to tell you something or to remind you something about the fly. So, just <coughs> so I don't know how familiar you are with the fly segmentation. Uh, it's a very classical paradigm. And the way it works, is that, uh, so this is, so imagine you have an egg, a Drosophila egg. So this is a Drosophila egg, which is staying for uh, uh, different uh, proteins. And so in the Drosophila egg, you have gradients, maternal gradients like bicoid. I don't know, how familiar are you with bicoid? Who has heard about bicoid in the room? Okay, who has not heard about bicoid? 
Okay, that's good. To, that's good for me to know. So bicoid, uh, it's it's a gradient. So this is it has gradient concentration. So it's in blue here. So it's more concentrated in the head than in the tail. And bicoid basically, I mean, it's it's very schematic what I tell you. And uh, many things I'm going to tell you today are very schematic. But bicoid, what it does, it is going to define different thresholds of activation for different genes. And these genes are the gap genes. So for instance, bicoid is simply activating hunchback. And so you know you have a threshold concentration somewhere here, and so above this threshold, hunchback is concentrated, and you have a whole zoology of gap genes activated or repressed by maternal genes, so that you can you know within the egg embryo you can have different regions expressing different gap genes. And so once you have these different gap genes, essentially at the interface of these gap genes, you're going to express pair rule gene. And then from this pair rule gene, you're going to define segments. So this is a way from a bicoid gradient, you end up doing segments. And so uh, you know, these are different uh, fluorescent proteins. So uh, here, bicoid would be this blue, and so it's more concentrated in the head than in the tail. Hunchback would be this green guy here, and red is simply a, a, a nuclear marker. And then downstream, this cascade of gap genes, uh, you form stripes, and then these stripes will later give you segments. OK, is it clear for everybody? Uh, the take home message on the, uh, from this is that you have a gradient, and then this gradient is going to, different, to define different threshold of activation. I'm going to come back to that in one second. Uh, the reason why I tell you about fly is uh, because I want you to forget immediately about what it is. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very classical paradigm in, uh, in uh, development. But vertebrate world in a very, very different way. So fly is a developmental monster. That's why I put this, uh, this little cartoon. Uh, for, compared to vertebrate or other insects, uh, it's, it, it's quite different. I mean, of course, you have uh, other flies which, which segment in the same way. But uh, in terms of principles, uh, it's very different from many animals. And uh, the reason is, I mean, there are many reasons. But uh, one of the reasons is that there are many uh, evolutionary uh, inventions in fly, like this protein bicoid I told you about, it's specific to fly. It doesn't exist outside of flies. And uh, the other reason is that uh, their, their development is very fast compared to other animals. So vertebrates have a much slower development compared to flies. So the way it works uh, in vertebrates uh, and in other animals and in other arthropods, it's a much more dynamical way of patterning. So uh, this is the first movie. So uh, I'm going to show you today. So this is a chick embryo. The head is here. The tail is here. It's a movie from the Pourquier lab. And here, uh, so this is basically the first process of formation of the segment in uh, in uh, in, uh, in in embryo. So in the chicken embryo. So let me show you again this movie. So focus on what happens here. So you here you have a structure called the tabled that is elongated in that direction. So this corresponds to the formation of the anterior-posterior axis of the chick. And as it, grow, as it extends, you see in this region, you are forming little structure here. So you see these balls here on both sides of the axis. Okay, let me show you again one last time. So you have growth of the table, and as it grows, you form structure here. So these structures are called somites. So if I tell you about somite later in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the talk, I refer to this structure. And these somites are basically the vertebrae precursors. Later, they will give you the vertebrae. So this is a cartoonish view of this movie. You have elongation. And as you elongate, you start forming somites. OK? Is it clear for everybody? So it turns out that this way of developing is very common to, of course, to all vertebrates. All vertebrates do something like this. Uh, the chick, it's a, it's a flat embryo, so it's easier to visualize. Uh, you have other embryos like a frog, they're more like spherical, so uh, it's less easy to see, but the principle is the same. Uh, what you might not be aware of is that most arthropods have a very similar way to segment. They have a, a growth zone, and as this growth zone is, uh, is uh, elongated, you start forming segments. So that's why fly is very different from many other insects. Uh, actually, most arthropods form segments this way. So I'm going to focus on this process here. And I will tell you a bit uh, during my talk about other arthropods, because there have been some recent progress on this. But I will focus really on vertebrate. Uh, I will tell you about this, this process. As you saw, it's a very dynamical process. You, know, you have elongation, you have formation of somites. So you need to account for this. So it's a bit more, I mean, it's complex. You, know, you have to deal with this, uh, this uh, 
uh, this dynamical system, and uh, and you'll see uh, you'll see how it works. So. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you form so nice and as the embryo is growing. So I just want to show you a slightly more recent paper and a uh, more recent example. So that's a paper from the Pourquet group. Uh, Pourquet is, I will tell you about Pourquet later, is, is uh, one of the most uh, important uh, scientists in this field. So published in Nature a couple of years ago, uh, where they studied snake segmentation. And this, you have this very uh, impressive uh, skeleton, so you see you have uh, you know, many vertebrae, you have like something like uh, 300 vertebrae, and uh, they categorize very, very uh, finely uh, what these vertebrae are. And uh, they, so you cannot visualize in real time uh, the segmentation of a snake, but you can, you can uh, you know, open snake eggs, uh, take out the embryo, and then look at how it actually uh, you know, kind of reconstructs the development of different snakes. And so you see how you know, it's, it's quite impressive. So it starts like this, you know, it's, this looks like uh, another kind of embryo, like, you know, uh, human embryo, chick embryo, or, or mouse embryo. But then as the development goes, you see it starts, you know, this, the, 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 the tail starts growing, growing, and you have this kind of spiral uh, going on. And as it grows, uh, you start forming somites. Okay. So uh, let's go a little bit into more the, uh, into the details of this process. <coughs> and so uh, here uh, I showed you three embryos: so mass embryo, a zebrafish embryo, and snake embryo. This is just to show you that they are they look very very much the same. And so the way a segmentation works is the following: the way somatogenesis works is the following. So you have the tail bud here. So this is what is growing in the in the chick movie. You saw it elongating. And you have a zone which is called the presomitic mesoderm, or PSM. So I would, I would refer to it as PSM later in my talk. And so the cells are not committed yet in this zone. And then uh, anterior to the PSM, you start forming segments. Okay? And the way it works, so this is coupled to growth. So uh, in the beginning, the table was somewhere here, and so it was growing that direction. Okay? So you start here, and then it's growing that direction. And as it elongates, you form somite one after the other. So this one is the first uh, form, then the second, third, fourth, and so on and so forth. So there is a sequential segmentation of the PSM, presomatic mesoderm. That's exactly the same in the zebrafish. You have the tail bud here, the presomatic mesoderm here, and then you form the somite here. And so it's, it's very much like uh, the, the, the <coughs> the mouse, you, uh, you started with, uh, with an unsegmented embryo, and so you had growth of the table, and as the table is growing, you, you form tissue, new PSM, and then this PSM sequentially segments from this, from this somite to this somite, and same for the snake. Okay? Okay, so now, um, at this stage, we are kind of like uh, embryologists from the 70s, you know, like people were looking at embryos and were able to describe what is happening. And this is really in the 70s that the first, uh, is actually the correct model or, or a close to correct model of uh, vertebrate segmentation was proposed. And now I'm going to tell you about this model, which is called the clock on reference model. And we proceed very much like the, the, the embryologists from the 70s in the sense that we're going to, I'm going to tell you about a couple of facts. Uh, of course, these facts are related to this uh, morphological feature and uh, this dynamical development I told you about in the previous slides. And then I will show you how, I mean, I will try to reconstruct the reasoning of Cook and Zeman, who, are, who have proposed what, what is called now the clock on reference model. So it's a very interesting paper, I and mean, I've just reread re it for this class. Uh, it's a really, really good paper. They got a lot of things correct. There are things which are probably, I mean, less correct, but uh, and it, it's very impressive the way they thought about it. And uh, if you're interested in this field, this is really the paper uh, to read. Okay, and uh, yeah, one word on this. It's, it's an interesting example where theory really inspired experiments. You don't have, I don't know if you have that many examples in biology, but really theory came first here and then that inspired a lot of experiments and, uh, and you will show the experiment that it inspired. So uh, let me first start with motivation of the clock on reference model. And so, um, I don't know, did you have a talk on scaling of embryonic development? No? Okay. Uh, at some point, there was a plan to get something like this, but um, 
one of the motivations of the clock on waveform model is, is somehow connected to robustness issues. Uh, I don't know if you had a talk on robustness issues. And in particular, so Cook, Jonathan Cook did a very nice experiment where he started modifying the number of cells in the organism. And there are simple ways to do that. For instance, if you take a frag, uh, fr uh, egg frog, uh, frog egg, you cut it in two, and then you, see, you separate the two parts, you're going to have a small frog, which is very similar to the big frog that you would have in the beginning, except that you have twice uh, as less matter. And so you can do experiments like this even later in development. You, are, you can have a frog egg and then try to remove cells from the frog egg and see how it develops. And so Coop did a lot of these experiments and he saw a very interesting feature. So for instance, imagine you, so imagine you take a, a frog egg, you divide the number of cells by two per two by you know, slicing the egg in the beginning after first division and then taking one half. Essentially, what you see is that the organism looks very normal. You have exactly the same number of segments, same number of vertebrae, it's, it's the same. But you have slight difference in the sense that you could, so for instance, how would you have, uh, how could you have the same segments? You could have, for instance, uh, well, first, of course, it's smaller. So you have smaller segments, everything scales. You have smaller heads, smaller tail, everything scales, so you have smaller somites. somites. But you have two, di two different ways to have smaller somites. <coughs> you could have, you know, cells are different, they have different size. Uh, but you have the same number of cells, for instance. You could have something like this. And what this is, it's not at all what happens. So cells have the exact same size, but you have uh, it's not more cells per somite, it's less cells per somite. Sorry, it's more cells per somite in a normal embryo, but <coughs> in a smaller embryo, you have less cells per somite. So there is no compensatory division, nothing that would, uh, you know, uh, that would basically fix the number of cells per somite. That's not what happens. And so this is very striking, because if you think about it, so you have a smaller embryo, and then if you look at one segment, you have basically twice as, not quite twice as less cells, but you have less cells per segment. So that means that, you know, this pattern uh, that you see of vertebrae <coughs> uh, is, so, it, it basically excludes something like, you know, as a physicist, you would think it's a Turing mechanism or mechanical instability, something like that. But here there is no scale, basically. So the message of this is that there is no intrinsic wavelength to the process because you can really dynamically adjust these wavelengths to have twice a segment twice as small. You, and you don't have, you don't have a, fi a fixed number of cells per somite, so that, does, that means that you do not count the number of cells, basically, within the one somite. So there is nothing, you know, nothing simple that you would think about as a physicist would work. Another experiment they did is that, they, I mean, it's, I, don't, I don't even know how they did that, but you, could you can basically restrict, the, the, you, you could have a smaller embryo in terms of uh, width, and then what you see is that the somite size, the somite length is exactly the same. So you, you basically change the aspect ratio of the embryo. You have like a thinner embryo, but then the, the, length, the length of the, of the somite is exactly the same. So again, that excludes any kind of you know, dynamical, mechanical instability uh, that tells you that this is not the right way to think about this problem. And so uh, that was the motivation for the clock on reform model. And uh, <clears throat> especially the scaling part. Why do you, how can you have uh, a, an embryo twice as small and still have the right number of vertebrae, the right number of segments? And so what would be a natural solution to this? A natural solution to this would be something similar to the fly. And uh, this is the opportunity to introduce uh, you to the French flag model in case you don't know it. Have you heard about the French flag model? Okay, so. It has nothing to do with the fact that we are in France. Uh, it was, uh, or I did not, I, I should mention who proposed this French flag model. It's not on my slide. So it's Wolpert, Lewis Wolpert, very famous Durantol biologist. I think the year is 73. Uh, he has a very famous Durantol biology book. I really recommend this book if you're interested in Durantol biology as a physicist. It's a very good introduction to Durantol biology, very clear, very clearly written, not too jargonic. It's really good. <coughs> so uh, Lewis Wolpert, what did he propose? So this French flag model. A French flag model is basically the fly idea. Uh, imagine you have what is called a morphogene. So this is your embryo. So our embryo are going to be one dimensional from now, essentially. This is just a line of cells. So this is the anterior posterior axis. And so imagine you have a gradient of a protein, like bicoid, I mentioned earlier today. And then imagine that this gradient of protein is able to, is defining different threshold. So threshold for a blue protein, threshold for a white protein, and threshold for a red protein. So you see that by defining two thresholds, you're basically able to define three fields, a blue field, a white field, and a red field. And then these fields can have different, different identities. That could be, say, first segment, second segment, or third segment. Or that could be head, thorax, abdomen. That's the idea of the French flag model. 
<coughs> and so uh, that would be a solution to the scaling problem in the following way. Imagine now that you have uh, an embryo which is twice as small, so twice as less cell. And then imagine that you have the same gradient, but with a, with a, with a, so same gradient in the sense that the maximum of the minimum value is the same. So this minimum value is the same as here, and this, uh, the maximum value is the, same, uh, is, 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 is the same as here. I imagine you interpolate linearly, in for, I mean, for some mechanical reason that you can interpolate linearly between these two extreme values. Then you see that even if you have an embryo twice as small, you are able to, uh, to, to, to have the correct proportion in, the, in your embryo. One third is blue, one third is white, one third is red. So that's why the French flag model is a simple solution to the scaling problem. You just need to fix the maximum of the minimum concentration, assume that some mechanism is going to interpret linearly, and then that scales everything. Yes? So but when you uh, set up the final value, the initial I could see because you have a source of, you know, I don't know, a signal which is start like diffusing or, but why would that fix the, the final value? So, so you could have, for instance, an active. Uh, so, okay, that's a good question. You could have an active process, for instance, uh, degrading this this source on that side, so is that this final value will be zero. And then you, you could have a linear, you know, if you have diffusion and then an active uh, sink, you could have a linear interpolation between a maximum and a minimum value. That would be one of the mechanisms to have scaling. But if you have only the source which is fixed, which, which but if you have, if you have Yes, you will need an active. I agree. You will need an active, an active process on the right side. Otherwise, if you simply have diffusion, you basically have uh, the diffusion length, and that, and then that, that fixes your length. The idea is that you need to find a way to get rid of any uh, intrinsic length in your system, and that's why you will need. I agree. You will need an active sink here. You need something else. That's totally correct. Okay, so um, that would be a very simple way to scale the embryo. The problem is that. It's rather implausible. So think about the snake, for instance. Imagine the snake. You have 300 vertebrae. So how come are you going to def define 300 threshold uh, in a gradient like this? That sounds completely implausible. So at that time, you know, Cook and Zeman were not thinking about the, the snakes. They were thinking about the frogs. They were thinking like 30 threshold is implausible. Uh, that's not so implausible if you think about fly, actually. But uh, I mean, definitely 300 threshold sounds like it's implausible to me. Uh, then there are other more phenomenological observations that exclude this mechanism. One, uh, one, clear, uh, <coughs> one clear mechanism that excludes this is that actually the number of somites is not very strongly controlled. You can have variation in the number of your vertebrae in different parts of the body. Uh, you have a variation in the number of vertebrae in different, uh, uh, even uh, <coughs> you know, if you compare animals of the same species, some of them have, uh, have, can have up to you know, one, two extra vertebrae. So there is no strong correspondence between uh, the, the it's, it's actually no strong uh, scaling. So, and then of course, the phenomenology of development that you saw is, uh, I mean, it somehow makes this implausible because it's really a dynamical process. You clearly have extension, elongation, and this would, you know, this would assume that there is a kind of gradient which is all along the embryo and that is you know, actively built. Uh, that's not, to me, that's not very plausible that you have something like this. Okay, so they, they, they say, okay, the French flag model is not the correct model in that sense. Still, <coughs> the idea is the following. Basically, they assume that there is a flange flag model on a continuous dynamical variable. So what does that mean? So imagine this is your embryo here. And um, imagine I define now a temporal coordinate on this embryo. And a temporal coordinate could be defined by something, you know, something, for instance, something accumulating or, uh, or something which is, uh, which is graded, but then is going to, de to decay. And then uh, as a function of the position, so the cells are going to be exposed to different, uh, I mean, for, to, the, to the signal for different times. But imagine now this is a dynamical variable. And so imagine that you basically activate uh, a process that we don't know yet. Uh, as a function of time is this way. So, this, so a process that will be first activated here. So the, this, is, this is the extract, this is an excerpt from the, from the paper. We should assume a fixed monotonic relation between a rate, so the important, the important word is rate, of an intracellular evolution of the ontal process and local positional information value experienced by a cell at the time of setting that rate. And so what they mean is that as a cell is exposed to concentration C, is going to be committed at a time T of C. 
And so the idea behind that is that this defines a temporal coordinate along the embryo that is, called, that is going to be called the wavefront. So essentially what I'm telling you is that you have a process that tells you that this cell here is activated first, then this cell here is activated first, then a second, then third, and then fourth. And of course, if you think about the growth process, for instance, this is the way it happens. You're going to start to grow here, and then there, and then, uh, you know, this is basically the order, the ordering of growth. So this is, you know, this would be a kind of temporal process defining, uh, <coughs> uh, for, uh, this, this would be the, the dynamical variable defining a wavefront. So this is the idea, that you have a timing process like that. And so now imagine that you have an embryo which is scaled, you know, like which is twice as small. And so, for instance, this growth rate is going to be divided by two. And then this means that this temporal coordinate can basically move uh, at, the, at, the, at the, you know, twice at a speed which is twice as small. But since the embryo is twice as small as well, it means that relatively to the big embryo, then these positions are activated uh, proportionally to this embryo. Do you see what I mean? Okay. <laughs> So that's the idea. It's a dynamical thing. So the way you should think about it is that there is a front propagating in this embryo. And then this front is going to, so this will be a front of committed versus uncommitted cell. So the cell on the right are going to be uncommitted. The cell on the left are going to be committed. And then you have a front moving at constant speed. And so that cell, cell in the beginning, in the, in the anterior part of the embryo are committed first. Then this guy committed second, third, and so on and so forth. So a front, you should think about the way front propagating in that direction. Yeah, the total time is the same, yes. So I say it's the growth. Hmm? Uh, so, yes, but if you have, for instance, if you have twice, uh, tw you know, if the embryo is twice as smaller, and then uh, if you have twice as less cell, okay, maybe I think I'm correct. So then if the growth rate is the same, you have twice as less cell. So the speed will be the same. No, because you, are, you don't have as many cells. Okay, so so you have like the, the number of cells available in the beginning is different. It's not an exponential growth; it's a linear growth, of course. Yeah, but but that's that the idea, you know, yeah, that you add, you know, you in, instead of going to, you know, you're going to add say one layer of cell per unit of time, and then you know, in the other embryo you're going to the, to add two units of cell per unit of time. So in the in the end, after time t, you have an embryo which is twice as big as the other one, which is what you want. Okay. Okay, so the first element of the clock on reference model is a wavefront, a co temporal coordinate along the embryo that is going to scale with the size of the embryo. Then the second element of the clock on reference model is a clock. Uh, so why do you want to have a clock? So these are sketches uh, from the original paper. I find this, I mean, even after watching these sketches for a while, I find them uh, totally incomprehensible. So I will give you other sketches uh, to, to explain what happens. But I mean, the basic idea is really simple. You have uh, this, you have the segments forming one after the other. So that suggests that there is, so you have a spatial periodicity of the pattern. And so that suggests that this, you know, if you combine that with the wavefront, then you could imagine that you know, if you have a temporal, a periodic, a periodic mechanism like a clock combined to the wavefront, then it can give you a spatial pattern. So the, this clock is going to essentially give you the, the space of formation of the somites. And, and imagine the wavefront is defining you a, tempo, a spatial coordinate. So if you combine a spatial oscillation, sorry, a temporal oscillation with a moving spatial coordinate, then you can imagine that you can make periodic, a periodic pattern. So, that's a sketch from the Cook and Zeman, uh, from Cook and Zeman. So the idea that you have an oscillator, and then the oscillator so is interacting with uh, with a smooth uh, manifold, and this manifold is corresponding to say here that would be the uncommitted cell, and then here's the committed cells, and so there is some interaction that will move the cell from the uncommitted state to the committed state, and then with that you can make a pattern. So this is this is uh, an excerpt from the paper. So. That's what they describe. Now I'm going to tell you what I understand and what I, what, I, what I think they really mean in this paper. So here is the way it works. So I have my embryo, and so now I have my temporal coordinate, which is given by the wavefront. So this dashed line here is defining the wavefront. You see it's going to move in time. And so now it's like the previous, fly, the previous slide on the, on the, on the wavefront. But now I'm going to add an oscillator. I'm going to add an oscillation. I'm going to assume that there is an oscillation which is synchronized all over the embryo. 
And so for instance, you know, so are going to be a, a protein is going to first, uh, its concentration is going to increase. So that's the first step of the oscillation. And as it increases first, then the wave force is moving in that direction, toward the right. Okay? Are you following me? So now <clears throat> it's going to go on increasing. And then let's assume that now you reach maximum concentration of this protein as uh, it oscillates. So this is maximum concentration here. And now the wave front is at a position here. Okay, so the third position on my, of my embryo. Then I'm going to assume that at this uh, phase of the oscillation, at this time, something is happening. And this something is going to define, to, so remember, the wave front is defining where the cells are committed versus where the cells are uncommitted. So on the left, they are committed. On the right, they are uncommitted. So now at this point, you know, you have interaction between the wave front and the clock. And I'm going to assume that when, at this phase of the oscillation, the cells uh, which are uncommitted, essentially they, they don't do anything, but the cells which are committed are going to go through uh, a developmental change. They're going to express all the same genes. It's possible now because they are, they are committed to do something. And they basically do it only at one phase of the cycle. And so I'm going to assume that they express a protein so that, for instance, they condense into a somite. So I'm going to, write, to, to draw a somite boundary. Okay, so you have one phase of the oscillation. The uncommitted uncom 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 cells, they don't care, but the committed cells, now they form a ball of cell, a somite, together. And so now my cycle is going on. So now the protein concentration is going to decrease. I have committed these cells into somite, and then I can just close the cycle. Now, again, the protein is no longer expressed uh, in uh, the embryo, but now you have formed one somite, and then the wave front has moved uh, toward, the right, uh, toward the right direction. Okay, yes? Um, so what is the physical nature of the wave front? Is it another protein concentration? Okay, i tell you about that later on. Uh, in my opinion, it's very debated what the wave front is. Uh, there is a molecular proposal, but I don't think this works. We have another proposal, so I will tell you at the very end what our proposal is regarding the wave front. Okay. Yes? So here, there's something I don't understand. If I continue your reasoning, yeah. for me at the end, you will get only one somite that is very large. Okay, no, because what will, happen, what will happen here? So the thing that here, I, it's, it's just because I haven't, I haven't put several somites, but this guy here, they will form physical boundaries here. So you could imagine that you close a boundary here. And so, and so, and so now here, you, this boundary is already formed. So the uncommitted cells, so they, you know, you really have a physical separation. Once you make the boundary, you have a physical separation. So this, and this is why you make different discrete balls. It's really a physical separation. You know, it's like, you know, you have like a, a caderine, a fringe, whatever. I don't know, sorry, I, sh I should know better, but you have like specific proteins that are expressed there and that, that are going to really segment uh, the, the tissue. And so then, so the somite will be extracted So no, 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 they really separate. Like, like you really have physical separation. So, so you really have, uh, uh, so you, you really make balls like this. So they're not stuck. There is really like, uh, so is, of course it's not nothing, but uh, you, you really like the cells themselves are separated. So here I actually, so you know, here you would have, for instance, extracellular matrix, but like the cells themselves, they are separated. I should have put uh, a, 3D, uh, a, 3D, a 3D visualization of the summit so that you see what it looks like, but they're really separated. Okay, uh, any other question? Just want to one on the two. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, in some way, yes, that's what I tell you here. Because the, this one is already, is this one is already uh, defined. But on the other hand, uh, you, you, have an active, you clearly have some kind of active process that is condensing all the cells which are, uh, which are committed. Uh, I'll tell you at the very end a bit about that. Okay, so um, yes and no. Uh, it's very difficult to do, but you can overexpress. So, for instance, you can make, uh, uh, you can change wind signaling so that you you have a clock which is much much longer, uh, which is going on for much much longer time than what you see in uh, in actual embryos. Uh, we can do it much better in culture, and I will tell you at the very end about culture. So you can take these cells here, put them in a dish. And then if you put the right medium, that's going to oscillate essentially forever. <coughs> so, but these are very recent experiments. 
this is, was done like last two years. In, your, in, in, in the book, is, you, you showed that the weight from somehow was coupled with growth. Yeah. I imagine to decouple the two. OK, so um, that's kind of an active question of the field right now. Um, as a theoretician, you would believe that you cannot really, you know, like the wavefront is some must be coupled to the growth in some way. Uh, in an, as a naive theoretician, uh, it turns out that that's not the case. It seems that it decouples, you know, sometimes the wavefront is going faster than the growth, sometimes it's going slower, but it's not really known why. It's, there is no, you know, there is no clear, basically so we don't quite know, I think we don't know what the wavefront really is. That's, that's my, that, that will be one of, my, of the take-off message of my, of my, of my talk. We, we assume this exists, but we don't really know what it is. OK, yes. Yeah. Who was first? I don't know. OK, wh wh whoever. I'm just a little confused. Uh, I'm just about to talk about the previous question. Isn't there a simple, naive explanation of the decoupled wavefront propagation if it's a simple diffusion of some Sorry. Oh, you mean, you mean if this is simple diffusion of something, then they should be coupled, is it what you tell? Yeah. Yeah, but that's not, obviously, that's not, the, what, that's not what it is. Oh, okay. But, but the thing that we know that there are molecular play, okay. Maybe we keep this discussion for later because I will tell you about the wavefront later on. Uh, I will first show you, so later what will happen, I will show you evidence for the clock, evidence for the wavefront. And then I will discuss at the very end other evidence suggesting that uh, this might be different than the common picture is. Here, I just want to give you the kind of, you know, it's a bit historical as well. I give you the, the historical perspective and how, you know, what was the question that inspired this field and experiments later in this field. And then I will go into, to, but you know, these things are crucial, you know. People strongly believe there is a ray front. I'm not that convinced. So, but I need to give you the kind of consensus model, okay? Okay, so, Prediction for the clock on wavefront model, where predictions are there is a clock. Prediction, second prediction that there is a wavefront, okay? And another more like quantitative prediction that if you think about the size of the pattern, just from dimensional analysis, and you can make that more rigorous, the size of the pattern is simply the period of the clock times the speed of the wavefront. So imagine you can mess up with one of the other. You know, imagine if this model is true. If you mess up with the period of the clock or with the speed of the wavefront, you should have an immediate output. And if you can control it, then you, know, you, could, you should be able to change the size of the vertebrae. Very simple ideas. OK, so uh, now uh, we are in 76. This is a proposal in 76. And uh, we have to wait until 1997 to see uh, an actual, you know, actual evidence of this process. And this is in a paper published by uh, Olivier Pourquier, uh, the Pourquier group, and Isabel Palmerim as first author. Uh, so in chic. Uh, I told you earlier, chick, chick embryo are flat, so they are easy to deal with. You can do a lot of manipulation. You can open the egg, close the egg, it's still going to develop. You can even culture the, the whole embryo. You can do a lot with chick embryo. So that's why it's, one, it's a very good system for, for, for these studies. The, the, the drawback is that you cannot do uh, genetics on it, transgen you know, transgenesis. It's not like a mouse where you can you know, put genes. Uh, you cannot do that in chick. So 1997. Uh, these people are interested in testing the clock idea. And what they did is that, so, so what they did is that they started, st they essentially stained for a gene uh, which is homologue to a hairy gene in fly. And hairy gene is known to be implicated in fly segmentation. So that's why they were fished for hairy in chick. And so now, they, so what they did, you know, they opened the egg and then they put, the, the, the take, the, take out the, the embryo, fix the embryo, and then you get, Imagine you, you know, imagine you scramble these things, you get different stainings, and then you see that hairy is expressed in some kind of random way. You know, in the beginning, you don't really see. Uh, there is, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's expressed in the tail, sometimes it's expressed, you know, more, more like in the anterior PSM, sometimes it's expressed only in the anterior, in the very, very anterior part of the embryo. And then they realize that now you can stage the development of the, of the chicken, and you can stage them in a very simple way, simply based on the number of somites. And, then when, and so you can define a temporal coordinate like this just by looking you know, how many somites you have, ordering the embryo as a function of the, of the number of the somites, and then you see a very nice pattern emerging where you have a very nice periodicity of the development. So you start here, for instance, you have 15 somites, uh, just one somite just formed, so you have like this hairy gene expression, then 
uh, the, you form, say, a second boundary, like in the posterior, then you see that here is moving in the anterior, and then, uh, you know, and so on and so forth, and you, you have a like kind of traveling wave of hairy moving from the tail to the anterior. Once you define the temporal coordinate, you clearly see that there is a traveling wave of hairy from the tail to the anterior. And so that suggests that in the tail bud here, there is a periodicity in the hairy signaling, there is a clock in the tail bud, and this clock is propagating toward the anterior to define the somites. Very simple experiment. So you order, you order them based on morphology of the somite. You, you look at what happens here. So here you see, for instance, you have 15 somites, 16 somites, 17 I somites. The 15, but inside the 15. Okay, so you, you, are, okay, you need to zoom and to look at the somite morphology precisely. You see, you, you, you can really like reconstruct, reconstruct wh where exactly you are in the cycle because you, you're going to form the, the boundary in some sequence. So you're going, in the beginning, you, you, you know, the way it works, is that in the beginning, you're going to have a somite, you know, like, like it's, it's a bit like, uh, so that would be my PSM here. You know, and then you're going to make something like that, you know. And then, you know, you can, you can see that. You can see just on the morphology, so that's my future somite. You can, you can order this stage just by looking very carefully at the somite. Yes? Uh, yes, yes, I think so. Okay, so that's first suggestion that there is a clock. Then they did a very, very cool and clever experiment, which is this, this experiment here. It turns out that what you can, so what you can do, you, you can see that there is a symmetry, an axis of symmetry here. And it turns out that it's really cool. You can cut the embryo in, in two, and then the, the, the two different half are going, halves are going to develop independently. So you can do that. And so what they did, very cool experiment, they cut the embryo in two, then they fixed one side of the embryo, and then the other side of the, one side of the embryo, and then the other side of the embryo, they wait half an hour, or one hour and a half, and then before fixing it, they fix it, and then they both, they both, look, they both stay for hairy. And so this, so this is a very clever experiment, because this is a way to have uh, you know, the dynamics in one single embryo at two time points. And so then what they see is that, so, so they, they, they take embryo and then they stain, so they fix it, they look at Harry at time zero, and then 30 minutes later, they know what Harry is, 30, min, uh, you know, 30 minutes later, and then you see now clearly that there is a propagation of a wave of Harry from here to here. You know, it's at two time points, two t clear time points in the propagation of the wave. And then if you wait 90 minutes, well essentially you get the same pattern roughly, but uh, well, you know, it's not exact uh, here, but, but, but basically you get one extra somite from here with respect to here, compared to here. So it means that you have this wave process, this wave propagating is really connected to uh, the formation of the, of the somite of the vertebrae. Okay? So I should mention this experiment is really, I mean, it has inspired a lot of people. So, you know, these are experiments that you can do when you don't have a real-time reporter. Of course, now we have real-time reporter in mouse and in zebra fish, we, don't, we still don't have a real-time reporter of the clock in, uh, in chicken. Uh, and so later on, I will show you actual movies where you see the wave propagating, so it's really nice and everything, but this was what you had to do in 97, or some time ago. Uh, okay, so let's see, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I guess my slide is not making exactly the point I want to make, but uh, this is really what, this is, you know, they, they can't, they, uh, you can trust them, they know how to count some ice, which I cannot. <laughs> I thought, I, no, no, this is, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know why. Why is they only put four, four hours here? It could be that this guy is the, okay, no, I, okay. I have a better answer, I think. Uh, this, uh, at the very end, you have a kind of, so this is not clear, this is not a somite yet, basically. So at the very end, you have a, a strong expression of, uh, of hairy, basically, and, and many other genes within, uh, within one future somite, and I think this is a strong expression that you see. So this, this, here it's not a somite, right here it is. And you see, you actually see there is a morphological difference here. You know, this, this, this guy here, so it's not so clear here, but here you, it's actually are localized within half a somite. And I will tell you about this half of somite business later on. 
So here it would be basically one somite, and here it's localized over half a somite. It's another way to stage the embryos. Okay, so uh, this is what you do when you don't know how, when you don't have reporter, and so people did that on insects like two years ago. Uh, so I told you that uh, primitive insects, they, they, they basically segment in a very similar way. And so these people, uh, they did, they did a, the exact same experiment that was done in Chic uh, in 97. They did it in 2012 in, uh, on Triborium. On tri and they looked for the odd skip gene, which is uh, one of the peril gene uh, in insects. And they did the exact same experiment. They found a way to culture the embryo. They found a way to fix half an embryo and then to let the other half uh, develop and then they see basically they see the same kind of idea, the same kind of pattern where you, you see kind of traveling wave of odd. Anyway, that, that just to tell you that these experiments really inspired many people and uh, this is the first way to you you monitor a clock. Okay, so uh, I started with the 76 model, then I moved back 20 years. Uh, I moved 20 years forward to 97. So now what is kind of the consensus model today? I'm going to call it the consensus model because uh, this is a model I think most of people in the field uh, agree on, even though uh, I think we had recent evidence that this is not quite the, the correct model. But let me tell you about what, you know, if you talk about uh, uh, somatogenesis uh, people, what they will think uh, a priori. So uh, this is a zebrafish embryo. So here it's uh, uh, it's it's uh, you see you have markers for uh, <coughs> a gene called delta, and so what you see it's it's really nice. You see you see the form somite here and here you see which what, what will correspond to the clock. So let me first focus on the clock part. So now we know that uh, there are many many genes oscillating. Uh, there are so many genes that we co can hardly count them. So this was done through microarrays. You, you take different parts of the embryo, you chop them, and then you look at what, what RNA are expressed. And so now as a function of space, which is supposed to be, uh, as a you know, the space coordinate is like a time coordinate. And so what you see is that, well, you have oscillation uh, of uh, many, many genes uh, in three different signaling pathways, not twin and FGF. Uh, it's absolutely not clear from these experiments what the core oscillator is. We just see that zillions of uh, things oscillate, but we don't know what is the core oscillator. But clearly, you know, there is an oscillation. So that was like uh, eight years ago. Uh, so that's just in terms of phenomenology of oscillation. Now what you can do is that you can look at, uh, in real time, embryos developing. So that's a movie from 2008 from uh, Alexander Olela when he was a postdoc in the Pourquier group. And so uh, this is a, what is called a Louvelu reporter. So Louvelu is basically a destabilized venous, which is downstream of a lunatic fringe reporter. A lunatic fringe is a gene which is well known to oscillate very well to give you very nice oscillatory pattern. And so let me show you again this movie. So that's a mouse embryo, and then you clearly see the wave of Louvelu propagating from posterior to anterior as the embryo is going. Yes? Lou Velu, okay, okay. Venus, so Venus, Venus is like uh, uh, it's 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 just it's not quite GFP. It's a different sequence than GFP. So, but it's just a fluorescent uh, protein. So that's Venus. Uh, destabilized means that the so the, the half time of uh, GFP is too long compared to the typical uh, clock period. Because here you have a clock period of roughly two hours, and I don't know what the li uh, lifetime of GFP is, so you probably know better than me, but it's much more than two hours, basically. So if you want to look at an oscillatory system which is oscillating with a two hours peri period, you better have a half time of a fluorescent reporter, which is you know, at least of the, of, of the same order of magnitude. So this is why you need to destabilize uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, um, this fluorescent protein, and you do it by uh, modification of the sequence uh, to make it, uh, you know, more sensitive to uh, the, the 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 machinery, de you know, degrading the protein. Uh, so that's why it's venous. So now Lou, uh, it's it's because it's because you actually see, so it's I'm sorry, it's molecular biology detail, but you basically they had to to basically put uh, downstream some part of the sequence of the lunatic fringe of the lunatic fringe protein itself. And then, uh, and then upstream, they put, uh, uh, they put actually a lunatic fringe sequence because lunatic fringe, uh, well, a sequence, sorry, where lunatic fringe is going to bind. 
and, and we, it's known to activate the transcription of, of the target. So that's, uh, so you know, you have something which is activity bioenergetic fringe, but itself it has some, it destabilizes its fluorescence, and then you need to do some genetic engineering for it to work. That's kind of an art, you know. <laughs> I think it took, it took a couple of years for Alexander to do it. Yes? Because here segmentation happens on the fringe is not expressed any longer. It's only expressed in the P PSM, it's the OSIG PSM. You have other genes, you're right. You remember that some other genes actually express in wave and then they, they localized in the embryo in the in apsomite. So the fringe is not the case. Yes? Okay, so definitely for instance here, HES is a notch and axine is a wind. So they are definitely out, they are out of phase, definitely. So, so that means that, you know, they, are, they don't, I, you know, they are not necessarily in phase. Uh, now, I'm not sure what you mean by synergistic or, or not in, the, in the way they act on the system. We don't, we actually don't know, you know, as I told you, you know, there are like zillions of oscillating genes. It's not clear how this pathway talk to each other. We just see that they oscillate, but it's not very clear how they talk to each other. I, I think we, we start knowing how, I mean, we have an hypothesis about the way this pathway talk to each other, but coming from recent unpublished data. At this stage, we were not able to tell. Yes? Is there any reason to believe that there could be multiple sources or multiple clocks instead of just one? Okay, uh, okay uh, we can talk about this offline. I think there are multiple clocks. Yes? Form. Okay, so I come, I, I come to this discussion later. I'll come back to this discussion later. It's not, I, I, this is something which is not quite well understood right now. People are focused a lot on the clock. Uh, I think now we make progress on the way the actual segment form. Uh, there is a genetic marker clear for where the, the, the somite is going to form, and I'm going to tell you about it in one second. But in terms of the physical process which is happening, I'm not sure it's quite known. But there are, but there are, there are a recent paper last year about this, so I, I'm going to tell you about this. Okay, uh, that's, a, that's a 2008 movie. I just wanted to, so that's a confocal uh, um, microscope. I'm going to show you a much better movie of the same process, which, so that's a paper we published last year. So that's the exact same thing, that's a, that's a, that's a Mouse embryo, except that we cut the tail of the embryo, or they cut, the, I'm not doing the experiment, they cut the tail embryo, uh, the tail of the embryo, and then, uh, well, you see what happens. So that's still lunatic free, and so you see this very nice wave, and you can guess where, you know, can guess where the boundary are formed, the semi boundary are formed. So you see growth, and then the wave, and it's going on. Okay. Okay. So now, that's for the clock, yes? It seems that the wave is moving much quicker than the, uh, much faster than the, uh, the growth of the tank. Uh, is this an no, at this stage, there is no huge difference. So I don't know if it's maybe just the embryo is dying at the very end or something like that. But at this stage, there is not much difference. Then, you know, as the embryo, as the development is going on, uh, there is a sl slow time scale modification of the period of the clock and of the growth rate, so that would change. But I, d I don't think you can see it uh, on such a movie. So it could be that the embryo is dying at the very end. I mean, you see, it, you know, it doesn't look that good at the very end, actually. Okay. Okay, so now I told you about the clock. So let me tell you about what people think, uh, uh, wh think about the font. So uh, a good candidate, on the, somebody's favorite candidate is FGF signaling. So, uh, and more specifically, FGF8. So FGF8 is just one protein. Uh, it means fibroblast growth factor. That doesn't really matter because it has nothing to do with fibroblasts in this specific system. But what they see, so it was observed. So this comes mostly from uh, two, li two lines of experiments that were done in 2004 and 2001 by the Pouquet group. So maybe let's start with uh, uh, 2001 uh, paper, so it's a very clever paper. Well, what they did, they put beads of FGF uh, in developing chick embryo. So that's a control, and that's a bead with FGF. 
And then what you see is that on the, on the side of the embryo where you have an FGF bead, you see that you basically make several small somites. So that suggests that you modified the dynamics of propagation of the fraud. So that's why they think that FGF is uh, a crucial protein for the front, defining where the front is. And I won't go too much into the detail of this because I don't think you can really account for that with the clock on reform model, actually. And I have another hypothesis of why you have this, but you know, like, again, I'm telling you historically how you do that. In the clock on reform model, I think you will make only one small somite, but there is no reason why you will make several small somites. That's a little bit technical. I can tell you a bit about that later, but you know, I tell you how the, what, what the evidence are and how what people interpret this, this data. So I'm, I'm, you know, this shows definitely that FGF is doing something to the front, but what it's exactly doing is not clear, in my opinion. Then in 2004, they observed that there is indeed a gradient of FGF uh, protein in the embryo. So, so it has all the kind of uh, uh, good properties for a waveform, because since you have a gradient, it means that as the embryo is going to grow, you're going to have a wave of FGF, which, is, which, will, uh, which will sweep through the embryo. And so that could define, you know, if, you have in a, uh, if you assume that FGF is defining a threshold of commitment, it means that it has all the good uh, characteristics of the waveform, because it gives you a temporal coordinate. OK, so that's uh, FGF, what the waveform is. So now, what happens at the front? After the front, so it's known that there is a gene, which is called MESP2, which is known to establish segmental borders. So what that means is that when MS2 is expressed, the cells expressing MES2 are going to cluster together and form a somite. And so this is a paper from Morimoto et al. Uh, in 2005, where you can have a real-time visualization of MES2. And so here you make a big stripe of MES2. So you should imagine that the clock is going from the wave is, going, is coming from the tail of the embryo, and then you make another big stripe of MES2, and then these cells are going to form somites together. And it's known that you know, if, you, if you mess up MES2, the somites are going to be fused, stuff like that. So it's known that it's a crucial gene. But that's essentially the gene which is, uh, which, which is assumed to define what the segments are. So that would be a summary of what the current, what I would call, consensus model is. So uh, this is a growing chick. So this is, a, this is drawn for a chick embryo. So uh, this is growing. As it grows, you have a gradient. So, so FGF and Win seems to uh, Win 3A seems to to do something to this. Uh, I mean, to, to do something to the front. So you have gradient of various proteins. Then at some level, they define a determination front or a wave front. And now you have oscillation of many pathways and um, probably more like notch pathways. Uh, so you have this oscillation interacting with the front. Once you are past the front and then the clock is on, you define this mess 2 protein. And then this mess 2 protein tells you to make one somite. And then something magical happens where you have like localization of genes in half a somite. And I'm going to come back to that in one second. OK? So that's kind of a sketchy view of uh, the way these things work. Uh, it's, I agree, it's very sketchy. Uh, I think there are a lot, of the, a, lot, a lot of things that we don't quite understand here. Uh, I'm going to try to refine a bit the view, but uh, as a disclaimer, there are things, things, many things we don't understand. So I try to answer the best as I can is, is, is your questions, but I, I, I acknowledge there are many things we don't know. So anyway. Um, I have like 25 minutes left, 20? Oh. Yeah, OK. OK. Um, OK. Um, I will uh, first tell you a bit about, um, I want to, so I wanted to give you a kind of sense of what the common ideas are in the field. And that's, uh, that's basically this sketch is like the common ideas. Uh, now I wanted to tell you a bit, just like say a bit about the modeling effort that were made in that field. And so the first thing I want to tell you, and and how this this modeling effort actually, uh, you know, shed light on some of this process, uh, some of the, uh, in detail about the process. So the first thing I want to tell you about is the clock. So what is this uh, this damn clock? What is this damn oscillation? And so uh, there was a proposal by Julian Lewis in 2003 that these clocks are based on essentially negative feedback loop with delays. 
So does everybody know what a negative feedback loop is? I just don't want to be sure. So this arrow means that there is a negative. So this is a gene which is essentially repressing itself. But the gene represses itself with a delay, uh, delay t, which is, uh, which is you know, just a delay. And so the way you, you can think about it, imagine that this is a Boolean variable, which is essentially turning itself on or off uh, in a negative way uh, with a delay t. So imagine you, are, you start with a Boolean variable on, then after a delay t, it turns itself off. And then after a delay t, since it's off, it's going to turn on again. So if you have a delay of t in a Boolean variable like this, it's easy to make a Boolean cycle of period to, to t. It's very, very simple, sketchy ideas. Turns out that you can make, you can transform this into a continuum, a continuous equation. So you say, you know, you have a gene x, and so this gene, this gene represses itself with a, with a delay t, and then there is some degradation constant, and then it turns out that it's very easy to make oscillations, to make this oscillating. Uh, and the period is still approximately twice t, it's t plus a correction. You can actually do the calculation explicitly uh, if the nonlinearity has an infinite uh, Hill uh, coefficient. It's not that difficult to do. I give that as an assignment to my biophysics class. It's really easy. Um, so you can, make, you can make something oscillating once you have a delay. And so Julian Lewis, what he proposed was that uh, you have a gene which is called HER1, and HER1 is actually an homolog to this hairy gene I mentioned earlier. And so it's a bit more complicated than simply a simple negative feedback loop with delay, where you would have a transcriptional delay and then a, a translational delay. Uh, you need to combine that with another gene which is called HER7. But essentially, this is you know, the idea that HER7 and HER1 form a dimer, and then the dimer is repressing the expression of HER1. So that's a negative feedback loop with delay. And then what you can do, and what, uh, what, it's quite beautiful if you think about it, what, they did is, what he did in this paper, is that he estimated the values of this delay. You can do that, and the idea is that, you know, you have, uh, the gene is that long, and so if you know how to translate, what is the transcription rate uh, in terms of, you know, base, uh, in terms of um, base per, per unit of time, then you can have an estimation of how long it takes to, trans to transcribe uh, one RNA, and then you can have an estimation based on the length of the, pro uh, of the RNA of how long it takes to translate the protein. And so you can do this estimation. It turns out that the translation are really negligible. They take one to three minutes. <laughs> well, negligible. You know, they're, they're very fast. They're very negligible compared to transcriptions. So transcription it takes, will take roughly 12 minutes for HER1 and seven minutes for HER7. And so when, when you put together, so imagine you have like, so of course, uh, you are limited by HER1 in this process. So you have 12 minutes here, and then if you say you have like, say, 15 minutes uh, as a delay, so that gives you an overall delay of 15 minutes. Uh, when you make the model, actually, we, if you include the, uh, the, the lifetime of the proteins, everything with these delays, you have more like a period of 37 minutes for the zebrafish oscillation. Uh, what you observe is that you have a true period which is more like 30 minutes. But still, it's quite impressive because you, know, you get somehow a value which is really close to the true period without the need to fit anything. You know, it just comes from the transcription delays or translational delays. So it's, you know, maybe it does not convince you, but at least I find that quite impressive that when you account for the delay, with, and if you assume there is a negative feedback loop, you get the period of a, a kind of realistic uh, period oscillation. A period oscillation. This yeah. plot is, uh, you are looking at a zero dimensional plot. Yeah, absolutely. When you put it in space, you are going to get all of this kind of traveling waves and so on. Okay, so uh, absolutely, I agree with you. This is just, uh, this is just, a tr uh, this is just in, as you say, it's zero D. Then, uh, if you want to be more complex, I agree, you need to account for the coupling of the clocks. People have done that, uh, not with this kind of models, but just with phase equation and I've studied what is happening. What you need to assume, because of, because of the fact that you have a wave, you need to assume that the period is, is a function of space. This is the only way you get wave. But so people have done this, you know, they have done this calculation and they get something, uh, you know, in terms of patterns, they get something which is realistic. But it's completely, it's actually completely driven by the period gradient. So maybe that's not that informative, but yeah, you're right. Um, yeah. I, I mean, there is a lot to say about the coupling. Uh, because one thing I haven't told you is that if you cut the embryo, you can do that. You can cut the embryo, you still see the wave propagating on both sides of the embryo, which means, which means it's more like a kinematic wave. It's not a real traveling wave. 
There are things like that. But still, we know that the coupling matters in some way as well for the actual oscillation of the clock. Because if you disrupt the coupling, the cells do not oscillate anymore. So it's, it's, a, it's like biology. It's not, there is no simple answer, you know? Yes? Sorry? You ignore that T is delay is a stochastic variable. Is a what? Sorry, is it's a stochastic variable. Oh, T, T, okay, here it's, it's completely deterministic. You can do it stochastic, sure, I mean, I have not done it, but it's, here it's assumed to be completely, uh, completely deterministic. And what changes if you... I, I haven't done, I don't know what happens if you make a stochastic, uh, I don't know, but, you know, you could, uh, you know, people have done that, like, they have modeled uh, oscillating clocks with, uh, with a delay and then having, you know, some kind of, uh, some kind of distribution of the delay. Uh, some people have done this, 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 uh, this, this calculation. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's going to oscillate as well. But you need to have, you, need to have uh, you know, of course, if the delay, I mean, I, I don't know exactly what the answer to that, but intuitively, I would expect that you need to have a relatively small spread of the delay. I don't know, and it depends as well on the half light of the problem for sure. People have done this calculation, I could give you reference. I know who did this calculation, but I don't know the answer, precise answer to your question. Uh, I don't know, but I can refer to references. Okay. Um, Uh, people have tried to change parameters. It's just a slide to show you that people try to change these delays. And it somehow works, but in a kind of disappointing way. Uh, you can change, for instance, the protein half-life, go from 20 to 30 minutes. And then you see, uh, and the problem is that you kill the oscillation when you do that. You, and you just have damped oscillation. And so you have mutants where you have, you know, you see that you're only forming a couple of somites, and then you, you, are not, you are in trouble. Uh, I'm not sure this really validates the model because the problem is that you kill the, you kill the oscillation. So you would really like to have something where you change the period and then you have uh, you know, longer or smaller somites and, and work in, you know, in permanent regime. Okay, um, the front. So um, people have proposed that the front is based on an interaction negative feedback loop between FGF and retinoic acid. And uh, the idea is that, so I told you, I already mentioned that FGF might be implicated in the front. There is another gradient coming from the interior of retinoic acid. And then the idea is that uh, a system like this where two proteins repress, repress each other are bistable, as you probably know. Are you familiar with this? No, by, by stability of negative feedback loop. Double negative feedback. Okay, I have once. I was not sure if you knew about it, but the idea that if you have two genes repressing each other, uh, if you write an equation for these two genes, it's, again, it's purely deterministic. Uh, you have a rate of A as a function of B, which is a decreasing function of B, so that's a nucleine for A. Then you can draw the nucleines for B, which has the same shape, and so you have three intersection points, uh, and this three intersection point corresponds to uh, unstable fixed point and then two stable fixed points. So this is how you get two ne ne negative feedback and double, double repressing gene give you uh, bistability. And so people have proposed that FGF and retinoic acid uh, are these two genes, and so here you have this kind of uh, uh, this kind of manifold between FGF and retinic acid, and the idea is that the clocks makes you jump from an FGF branch to retinic acid dominated branch, and it's interesting because this so that was published uh, seven years ago, and you can compare this figure to the original clock and reference uh, figure, and so you see you have the same idea that you have a bistable manifold com going from uh, committed to uncommitted, oh sorry, uncommitted to committed. So. That's a proposal. Okay, so I just have 15 minutes to complexify a bit, so I'm, I'm going to go rather quickly on that. Uh, so with some of these we have already discussed in the question. Uh, it's not simply that you have a clock on a refront. Uh, on the one hand, oscillators are not synchronized in the tail. You have a wave, clearly. And on the other hand, some might have internal structure. It's not that, uh, and you see them. And so I start with the structure. So uh, the structure of the somite, if you look at an individual somite, it has a polarity. You have half a somite which can be considered as anterior and half a somite which can be cons considered as posterior. And so you, have, you definitely have markers for this anterior and posterior part. And so for instance here, uh, you know, uh, 4.1, it's a posterior marker. You clearly see it. 
uh, DL1, delta is a posterior marker, but you also have anterior marker like a lunatic fringe, the beginning is an anterior ma marker. Delta D, I mentioned delta earlier, it's an anterior marker. So there are, there are structures of the somite. And if you think about it, the clock on the model does not account at all for any structure of the somite. It just tells you where to form a somite, but it does not tell you that there is an anterior and posterior part. OK, so uh, how do you answer to that? How do you model this? Well, it's actually not that difficult to answer this. Uh, you can just assume, so i just show you one uh, a simulation I did myself some years ago. Uh, it's not very difficult to make stripes uh, that will define a cone for anterior and posterior. So uh, this is your traveling wave. Re this region here would be, uh, would be a clock, just like the segmentation clock, a negative feedback loop with delay. And then if you plug that upstream of a bistable system, then it's very easy to make structure with looking like stripes. So if I had more time, I would discuss how would you make somite and stripe at the same time uh, now. But uh, I hope to have, maybe if we have a, qu a session of uh, questions later on, uh, I will tell you more about that. But that's really, so the message, the bottom line of this is that if you have a bistable system which can read the phase of the clock, it's quite easy to discretize the phase of the clock and define an anterior and a posterior part in a somite. That's what, that's what the message is. Okay, I'm going to skip that. Okay, so now we're moving to really modern stuff, like uh, last two years, what people are doing in this field. Uh, so now what you can do is that you can have a very nice real-time analysis of the oscillation in living embryo. And so that's something we published uh, two years ago. So these are the brafish embryo. And here you have a fusion protein to, to visualize uh, the oscillation of this HES gene I already mentioned. And so these are the kind of movies that you can obtain. So very beautiful movie where you see you s the blue are membrane markers and you see that the wave, you know, you see green wave propagating from uh, tail to head. So you can really see that with a very nice resolution. And so then what you can do is that you can start analyzing. So the good thing is that now you can follow individual cells. So that's what you can do. You can do a 3D imaging of the clock, follow individual cells. So this is an example. So this is a tracking of individual cells. And then once you have tracked the cells, you can look at in any given cell, I mean, not in any given cell, but you can look at cells that you can track uh, for the whole movie. You can look at what the oscillation in these cells is. And so, uh, I mean, why am I on this paper? I did this tracking and all of that. It's, uh, it's kind of tough. You know, I don't know if you've already uh, done this thing, like segmenting the nuclei, tracking them, and all of that. It's, it's a pain in the neck. But, uh, you know, you can do it. And so, uh, and so then from that, well, uh, you can basically reconstruct, for instance, so the phase information at any given time in any cell you can track. And so this is like a visualization of this phase information. So we have this coloring on the trigonometric circle of the color as a function of, of the phase. So this, this, this movie was very painful for us to do, so I'm going to show you again. Uh, because it's worse, it's worse. You know, it's a lot of work behind this movie, but you see, uh, you see the phase wave propagating from posterior to anterior, and so you see the somite here. Or from, uh, actually, uh, uh, we see, you can guess what the structure of the somite here is. You see, uh, you, have, you see that there is really a physical separation. Yeah. You had this question earlier today. You can, you can look at the signal uh, in real time of uh, the oscillation. And I mean, there are many things to tell, uh, and I don't have time to comment all of that. You see that the period is going to be longer when the cells get more anterior. You see also the amplitude of the signal is changing, which is interesting. And I think the amplitude might play a role in actual boundary formation. But for now, and then you, say you can start looking at things like coupling of the cell cycle to the segmentation clock. And there are very interesting things happening. We see, for instance, that the cell divide only in very preferred phase of the segmentation cycle, things like that. All of this is work in progress. And so I have a slide on, about work in progress. We are currently using this data to try to get a sense of what is happening. So I told you about the cell cycle. Maybe there is mode locking between the segmentation clock and the cell cycle. This is something we, we are interested in. Uh, we want to see, uh, so there is this business of the gradient period. You know, the period is definitely longer when the cells get more anterior. Why is that so? We don't know. But at least just doing the phenomenology of that is going to tell us um, to learn something. And we believe that uh, the this period of the gradient can actually play a role uh, in the formation of the somite themselves, and more specifically on the way you structure the somite between anterior and posterior, as I told you earlier, earlier today. OK, so that's something that was done like two years ago. Now, last year, uh, so uh, in collaboration with Alexander Olela, uh, we published 
some very interesting data, and uh, I think the modeling is interesting too, be not because I did it, but because uh, it, I somehow it learns. I think it gives you a very different perspective on what the font is. Um, so the idea is the following. So you take an embryo. So I, I, I drew a cheek embryo, which is not quite uh, what happens because we do it in mouse. I should change this drawing, but whatever. Uh, you take a table, you, you, you place the table, and then instead of having an embryo which is growing you know, from head to tail, what you get is some kind of uh, you know, a table with a circular symmetry. And then you start having waves. Instead of having waves going from, you know, linearly moving from head to tail, you're going to have concentric waves. This is what you see experimentally. So I, I just show you exactly how you do that. So this is a tail bud. Again, you take, so it's really, it's really you take the, the tail of the embryo and then really you played it like that. It's really this way, you know, you played it and then instead, and, and now you're looking it from top. So that's what you do. And then what you see what happens. So then, these cells are just, you know, they spread a bit, okay? And so, and that gives you somehow a monolayer, almost monolayer of cells here. And then what you can do is visualize the oscillations here. And so the, you see what happens. You have this kind of nice waves from the inside to the outside. So that's a very cool system. And one of the reasons why, the reason why it's very cool that you got rid of this growth business. So this is a system which is good to somehow decouple the growth from uh, the front, say. Okay, so then what you can see is that you can, for instance, you can look at cells somewhere here, and then you see that they are going to oscillate for many, many, many times. So, you know, cell in this region, so going to oscillate many, many times. They actually oscillate much more than when they would oscillate in the embryo. So in the embryo, they would oscillate like, you know, five, six times. Here they oscillate, you know, I don't know, like, 20 times. So this means that you can maintain them in the oscillatory, in the oscillatory state, which is cool because that means you can study the oscillation much better. Here the commit. Okay, I'll come back to that in one second. Uh, they commit eventually, you'll see. Um, okay, so then what you can do is that you can do, you can draw a line and make chymographs and then see what the slope of the phase gradient is, how it changes with time. And you see that, the, the, you see that the, way, the, the phase gradient is actually changing. So this means that you somehow reconstruct this phase gradient, but in a dish. But it has a very different property because you got rid of the growth. It's really a good system to study the establishment of the phase gradient without growth, which is quite interesting. Okay, so they commit. This is your question. They commit, you start seeing like boundaries like this. You know, but so now, of course, now this is no longer like small balls. These are like entire lines uh, where the cells are committed and then, and then form somites. So these are, these are real somites. They have all, so they have, for instance, MES2. MES2 is a marker for the somite formation. You see that you have like a huge lines of MES2. It's not quite concentric on this culture, but you know, the idea is that you have, a, you reconstruct a flat system uh, phenomenologically, uh, you know, behaving the same way. So, this is a good in vitro system to study segmentation because you are, essentially you got rid of the growth. So now, uh, so we got interested into the dynamic of the phase gradient, and this is related to, yes? Is something regulating the directionality on top of the A directionality of what, sorry? The directionality of the, of the, of the wave? Yes, there is a directionality, there's a clear directionality. So if you look at the movie, if you look in detail, it's actually quite interesting. We have this kind of black hole here. And the wave seems to originate from this black hole. Yeah. We don't quite understand what happens here, but definitely oh. there is a black hole and the wave seems to emerge from this black hole. This look like this, we think these are like tabled cells. For some reason, we don't see the lunatic fringe oscillations. But, uh, and I have an idea why we don't see the lunatic fringe oscillations. But, but we, there seem to be some kind of, somehow, a source, a source of something, definitely. Okay? Okay, unfortunately, I don't have time to go in detail about the, uh, the details of this paper. So I might just mention a couple of things. Uh, so we can study the phase gradient. And what we see, what is very striking is that the phase gradient, if you look at the slope of this phase gradient as a function of the number of association, it's a very nice exponential. So you, in a log plot, uh, you, have, uh, you have a line, essentially. And by and large, what that means is that this system is scaling. And what that means is that now if you look, so at some point, you start doing segments. And now one thing you can do is look at, for instance, what is the ratio 
of the segment size as a function of the complete of the, of the complete field of oscillation. And what you see, you have a linear, clear linear relationship between the segment that you form and the, 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 the size of the of the of the uh, the size of the tissue which is not segmented yet. You have a clear linear relationship. So you get smaller, you make smaller and smaller somites, and these somites are ex and they are exponentially smaller. And what we did, I mean, they did the experiment at 37 degrees and at 33 degrees. The reason why they did it at 33 degrees is that we know that the clock is, is slower at 33 degrees. So we wanted to see what is happening if you have a slow clock and you slow down the process, it's working exactly the same way. Now, what you can do is that you can compute, you can look at what is the phase difference between the region where you make uh, the segment and the table, the presumptive table. And then what you see, what is very interesting is that we see that this phase difference is constant. We always have almost a, a full cycle, actually. It's a, it's a full cycle. You have a two pi phase difference between the table and where you make the future summit. And so our proposal is that this is a wavefront. Our proposal is that the way the system works, it's using the, this temporal coordinate of the wave to actually define where the segment is. And I don't have time to go into details of why this proposal uh, it might be correct or not, but you know, I told you earlier about the French flag model on the dynamical behavior proposed by, by Cook and Zeman. They were telling you, okay, we have a rate propagating like this, which gives you a temporal coordinate, basically. And what we believe is that this temporal coordinate is basically defined by the phase difference between uh, oscillator at the table and oscillator <coughs> at the front. And it has many implications, because that suggests, for instance, that there is a way to measure this phase difference. So there might be another oscillations. And I can tell you more about this offline if you want. I cannot show you data on that. But uh, anyway. So let me skip that, because I don't have time anymore. I don't have time to go into the modeling. But basically, you can reconstruct very easily this experiment if you assume, uh, if you make this assumption that you have uh, a constant phase shift between the front and uh, the tail bird, and you can have the scaling and everything. You can do it very easily. You can make a model. So I'm going to. Um, Okay, I guess I'm going to wrap up now. Uh, the only thing is that you have some debate in the field right now. So there was a paper that was published in 2000, like uh, earlier this year, on the fact that you can make somites without a clock. And the idea that you take a, a, you take a cheek tissue and then you expose it to BMP. And then what you start seeing, you start seeing balls like that. And these structures have some markers of the somites. But for instance, they don't have the polarity marker. So there is a debate in the field right now. People argue that these are not real somites. People to tell you, but they still have the morphology of somites. Uh, there is a lot of debate now. But what, uh, to me, what it shows, and I think it's a beautiful experiment for this, what it shows is that you have some kind of process that is able to really you know, make balls of cells spontaneously if you, if you express some genes. And I think, to me, this is more like the terminal patterning process giving you the actual somites. I think this is what is responsible for uh, these lines. And this is this program which is activated here. But you don't have the structure, so I think you know, to have all this, you know, all this discussion we had in the beginning uh, from the Cook and Zeman process about the wavelengths and things like that, obviously here you have an intrinsic wavelength uh, to, form, to form this mechanical, you know, I think it's probably a mechanical uh, patterning process. So you have this wavelength, and, uh, and so you cannot exclude that. Uh, I just want, so I'm going to wrap up, but I just want to show you, you know, a movie of gastrulation. I don't know if you've seen this movie. My point here is to tell you that development, development in vertebrate is very, very dynamical at many, many stages. And it's dynamical, but it's genetically controlled as well. Uh, so you have like kind of pattern, initial pattern. You have like, so here, Bracuri, for instance, a marker for the mesoderm. Cordine is a marker for this called the organizer. And then the tissue is going to involute to, through the, uh, the organizer. But, but my point is really, again, to tell you that these ideas on somites and the dynamical system controlling somites and how it is coupled to growth and everything, if you want to understand vertebrate development, you need to apply them at all levels. So, and, and I'm not going to tell you about this, but we apply this to Hox genes. We make some models. I'm going to skip that. Let me wrap things up, and I give you what my conclusions are uh, about all these things. So, as you saw, probably saw or understood, there are still many open questions in the system. I think we're only starting to scratch uh, the surface of what we can do. And the reason why we're only starting to, to scratch the surface is that because, essentially, 
or everything which is related to timing in vertebrate development is hot. It's a hot topic because we just had new tools recently available to really visualize in real time genetic expression uh, in live tissue or in culture. So now we have a lot of markers and we can, you know, we can express a lot of proteins in real time and see how you know, genes are oscillating, how genes are, you know, gene consumption vary uh, in real time. The caveat is that there is a, you know, you need to properly analyze them track cells, and as I told you earlier, this, this, is, this can be quite difficult. Uh, you learn a lot by just looking well uh, thought experiments. You know, if you, I mean, I would love, for instance, to redo Cook experiment, you know, divide the number of cells by two with an actual reporter to see how the clock is behaving. This kind of, you know, very targeted uh, perturbation combined to looking are really quite useful. And uh, this idea of, you know, having a cell culture flat and then looking at this wave propagating. Uh, this is one of the things you can do. And I think there is room, uh, much room for physics approach. On the theory side, there are clear questions coming from dynamical system. I haven't told you much uh, about couple oscillators, but there are ideas. You can think about geometrical models of what happens uh, in phase space. And then in experiment, you can make, I mean, I think there is a need for well-controlled culture on, this, on, on, such, uh, on such system like microfluidics, uh, using micro and nano patterns to really have very controlled culture uh, and make quantitative measurements. And so I absolutely need to wrap up by thanking my collaborators on, this, on all of this project. So uh, one of my collaborators is Olivier Pourquet. So he's a guy who discovers the segmentation clock. Uh, we have some collaboration on, uh, on uh, Connex ideas related to, to, um, uh, grow, to embryonic growth. Uh, you saw movies from two of my collaborators, so Sharon uh, Amaker, who is now used to be at UC Berkeley and now is Ohio State University. So these are the people working on zebrafish. So we're looking a lot at how you know the cells, the oscillation, uh, individual cells is changing in zebrafish. Heidelberg. So Alexander is. Uh, uh, we have a very nice collaboration on mouse and a very active uh, collaboration uh, to study this phase gradient. And then on the theory side, uh, Vincent Hakim, uh, we started doing this modeling of uh, stripe formation, Eric Sidja, I did my postdoc with him, and I have currently, uh, Matthias uh, is one of my grad students uh, working on this topic. And so I'm done, so thank you for listening to me. Okay, so that's a good, very good question. Okay, maybe you just can repeat the question. Okay, the so, so the question is what is the difference between our model and the clock on reference model? So uh, the first question I have to ask is which model, because I, have to, I presented two models of mine. Is it, by, is it because of the stripe, the stripe business or the phase gradient business? Which model are you referring to? Um, the phase model. Okay, the phase model. So in the phase model, okay, so the clock on reference model is that there is an independent variable, which is a wavefront, which is propagating from head to tail, and this wave front is defining where you're going to form the somite. One of the aspects that there is a clock and there is a wave front. Potentially, you can decouple the two. Our model, we say no, you cannot decouple the two because the clock contains the wave front information. It's when the clock is delayed by a two pi phase shift with respect to the table that you form the somite. So you only have one temporal coordinate, which is defined by the clock. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, but what we say is that, so the, I did not have time to go into the detail of this, but we say that this progression in space is actually, uh, is actually intrinsic to the clock itself. It's slowed on in space. Maybe I can give you more detail. I, didn't, I, I had some slides about this, how you act properly model that, but the idea is that you can do it in a cell autonomous way. That's the thing. And so the clock is going to slow down by itself up to the point where it's going to be phase shift with respect to some reference oscillator I did not tell you about the reference oscillator, but there is a kind of reference oscillator, and we, and we see it actually. And and the, when there is a phase shift of two pi, boom, you make the, the you make the, the segment. So it's a, it's a, so that's the idea, and we have evidence for that. But uh, I did not show you. I didn't have time to show you everything. I was wondering maybe I missed something, but so all of the models are trying to explain this oscillatory behavior. Yeah. Does any of the model contain why, when it stops? Why is there 
more or less this kind of size, the optimum one. Okay, so most of the, that's true that most of the. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, so the question was, uh, so most models are focused on the clock oscillation, and then uh, do some models consider why they stop and how they stop. Okay, so answer to that is that very few people really are interested in how the clock stops. That's true. So, so there are not that, mean, that much data on that. One of the reasons is it's quite difficult to perturb this system in a, in a controlled way so that you will still have the stopping and modify local properties, you, you know, it's difficult. You can make the process longer, so if you know... Yeah, you can, but that's, that's what, absolutely, but that's what we're doing. These are very recent data from last year. So, I, absolutely, in the dish you can make it longer. So, this is a super cool system to, st to actually assess this question. You can start to put stuff on it, see how this is going to modify the font, all of that. We are doing this, but this is very recent. Uh, what do you mean stem cell hypothesis? Sorry, I don't know. I d okay, the question is that do you account for stem cell hypothesis? So I don't know what stem cell hypothesis is. What do you mean? Okay, so probably then you don't get on because... Yeah, <laughs> Maybe I'm like uh, <laughs> Monsieur Prudhomme, you know? <laughs> yeah. the lines that the and the movement of the mines yeah. Okay, so so in some way, you, okay, the way so the stem cell hypothesis, the way I understand it is that you would have a stem cell reservoir, and then they will differentiate, and that will account for the process in some way. Okay, so we definitely, I would the answer to that is that the tail bud for me is like a stem cell reservoir. So it's it's somehow implicit in what I told you, but in my opinion, there is such a reservoir, and the tail bud cells are very different from the other cells. Okay, so the question, what does a uh, snake model tells us about this process? So the, what they did, uh, so you are, first it shows, it's a cool example of uh, somatogenesis going on for a long, 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 long time. And w the way, what they did with this snake model, the question they had was how it, why, why do you have so many somites in snake compared to mouse, compared to chick, you know, why, what is, what is, what is we controlling the somite number? That was a question they asked. And then what they see is that basically, uh, so this is done in the paper, they compared things like the length of the PSM versus uh, as a function of time uh, in different animals, and then they see that you, so what happened in the, in the other animals is that you see that the PSM is going to shrink, 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 until boom, at some point, you, you end up some mitogenesis, you have a very small PSM, and then you no longer have some mites. So they see that for the snake, it stays long for a much longer time. And they compare, and so that's what they characterize in this 2008 paper. So it tells you something about the control of the PSM size. And of course, all of that is related to what the waveform is, what is the growth, and these questions are, in my opinion, unanswered yet. I think we got some answers with Alexander from this culture. Uh, we have the, we, I think we have a better idea of what is controlling the PSM size, but this is not known yet, I would say. Thanks again. Thank you.